I had a very interesting case come in my office uh, last week, and it begs the question as to whether Lyme disease or oral spiroketosis was the problem. Both patients, a husband and wife, were diagnosed with Lyme disease as well as their daughter. However, the wife showed symptoms and the husband and the daughter did not show any symptoms. The wife had Bell's palsy and fatigue and other symptoms that are related to Lyme disease. However, the husband was uh, perfectly normal as was the daughter. In this case, we found spirochetes in the gingival sulcus, which begs the question of, is this a misdiagnosed case of oral spirochetosis diagnosed as Lyme disease? Or is Lyme disease actually in the gingival sulcus? Are Lyme disease in the gingival sulcus? That really is a good question. We don't know at this point. If they are, then uh, the gingival sulcus is actually a good reservoir for spirochetes in general. And if they are there, then they can recontaminate the rest of the body once uh, treatment has done, been done for Lyme disease. I wonder if oral spirochetosis is misdiagnosed as Lyme disease. Here's the panel of the wife and the bone level appears normal. The probings all were within normal limits. And her history was a tooth number three. For several years she had problems with the root canal and the pain never seemed to go away and she finally had the tooth extracted. During this period of time she developed Bull's palsy on the right side and subsequent to this she developed the symptoms of Lyme disease. I checked her pockets uh, bacteriologically and the only place I found spirochetes was in the vicinity of tooth number three. A close-up shows that there are no pockets around the adjacent teeth. There's a little bit widening of tooth number four but you would never suspect that this patient had periodontal disease yet she has all the symptoms of Lyme disease but no sign or physical sign of periodontal disease in any of her teeth. Here's the PAs of the husband who had spirochetes in every gingival sulcus and a variety of spirochetes which I'm going to show later. He has no pockets and no sign of periodontal disease however he had plaque and calculus on his teeth which I uh, did a cleaning and scaling and root planing and he has no pockets that you can visibly see on the x-ray as well. But when you see the microscopic that I'm going to show in, uh, later, he has spirochetes, uh, several varieties, and very virulent, very fast-moving spirochetes. Now here's the microscopic of the husband. Interesting enough, he had spirochetes throughout his whole mouth. The wife, she didn't. She had, I couldn't find spirochetes until I got to the tooth that she had a problem with. But here, the husband had far more spirochetes with no symptoms than the wife did with a few spirochetes. It's interesting to note that these spirochetes are extremely heavy, heavy duty. They're very thick and uh, they're moving extremely fast. And the uh, screen you also see a lot of fast moving rods these spirochetes are also associated with many different other kind of bacteria especially spinning gliding and unulating rods and in this situation um, he had quite a few other uh, bacteria as well but you can see that these spirochetes are moving extremely spinning extremely fast they're very thick these are probably about the thickest spirochetes i've ever seen and i wonder if the fact that they're so thick that they may be more virulent or, or cause disease more than the really fine spirochetes. You can see a little what I think is a cyst form right above the spirochete there and we find these mixed in uh, these fields along with the spirochetes as if they always have reserve of the cyst forms in case something happens and uh, the environment kills the spirochete they always seem to have these spore forms in the background. You also notice that in his case he has the small uh, diameter spirochetes as well. Now I don't know whether the small ones are oral spirochetes and the large ones are Lyme disease spirochetes or not. We have no way of knowing at this point. The little black bodies you see floating by when I was doing stop action photography on those it's the ones that had the morphology uh, that I showed in my book. 
uh, when you stop action them, they actually have it's a donut, a flat donut shape with a, a light uh, center to it and a, a light halo around it. Now this is the transition to the wife and here you can see the spider type spirochetes or grouping or uh, colony. And so this is um, a very typical uh, configuration that we see in so many cases where spirochetes are clumped together. I don't know what they seem to be grasping in the center, but they seem to be uh, holding together in some sort of configuration. In her case, we only found these spirochetes in the vicinity of the previous extracted tooth number three and the gingival sulcus is uh, adjacent to that uh, extracted region. She complained about the Bell's palsy and I wonder if the spirochetes in that area were able to get into the trigeminal nerve and then affect nerve sensation on that side of her face. I know that this has been reported in the literature that spirochetes actually can get into nerve endings and actually affect nerves. Now also I wonder in her case whether it's the oral spirochetosis is a problem and it's really not Lyme disease but a misdiagnosed case of Lyme disease which is actually oral spirochetosis and she's having her symptoms from spirochetes but not necessarily from the Lyme disease spirochetes. This I think is a very interesting question. I think that we need to solve this problem because as far as I'm concerned oral spirochetosis can produce the same symptoms as Lyme disease but I think that the diagnosis may be mixed up uh, with the DNA of the different spirochetes and maybe there is cross-contamination in the tests. So this study needs to be done and we need to figure out uh, which spirochetes are in the gingival sulcus and whether Lyme disease actually lives in the gingival sulcus. And if it does, then what are the implications of this? Can we treat Lyme disease as periodontal disease? Um, when we get uh, done treating Lyme disease, are spirochetes protected in the gingival sulcus and thus recontaminating the body? Uh, these questions all need to be answered. Right now, I think um, it's up in the air. And if it's true that Lyme disease or the Borrelia burgdorferi can live in the gingival sulcus, then this is going to open up a whole new world in the Lyme disease research because if we don't get rid of them there, we're not going to get rid of them anywhere because uh, through bacteremias and periodontal disease, they'll constantly reaffect the rest of the body and therefore you'll never ever get a final treatment of Lyme disease. The question comes up is how do you diagnose this? Is there a DNA study or is there some kind of a test that you can do to determine whether it's Lyme disease or oral spirochetosis? The answer right now is there is no DNA test that we can do in a gingival sulcus. The only way you can diagnose this is microscopically with a microscope. And I think it behooves us as dentists to go ahead and purchase a high quality microscope and start looking at the gingival sulcus as our patients especially patients that have a diagnosis of Lyme disease. I think that we could be very helpful for the physician because if we find oral or if we find spirochetes in the gingival sulcus it needs to be reported to the physician and also for the centers of disease control so that we can get to the bottom of this problem.